Hello, everyone. Welcome to lesson number two for Astro at Home. Um, so welcome who's everyone to everyone who's online with us right now. Uh, if you're new, Astro at Home is an initiative. We just decided to start quickly on Monday. Um, we know many kids are out of school and you're home and might be wondering what to do. So we thought we could give you astronomy courses. Um, so here we are. And um, just as, so you know, if you're online on YouTube, um, we just, there was a bug with the chat. I think you need to reload the page for it to be active again. Just so you know, uh, I think that's what's happening. We're improvising for this. So we're doing the best we can. We had no time to prepare basically to set this program up. Um, if you do have questions, we will try to answer as many as we can in the chat. Uh, please try to keep the chat, um, you know, read it. Um, um, Sorry, missing my words here. Uh, please try to keep the chats uh, related to the um, the content of the program. Like, don't start talking to yourselves because it gets very confusing for us to see uh, the questions. But you are welcome to uh, write in the chat, and if you don't want to see it, you can hide it on YouTube as well. So um, today, here we go. Today we're going to be talking about what we can observe in the sky, and as you might see, there's someone else with me. I'm pleased to have uh, my colleague from the Dunlap Institute, Michael Reed who will be uh, showing you what you can observe in the night sky. And he will be using a tool we call Stellarium. So it's a free planetarium software. The links will be added to the webpage. So the Astro at Home webpage that you've been using on our website, the links will be added there. But I just wanted to show you that um, it is possible to access it online. Uh, Stellarium.org is where you can download the program to install it on your computer. There's also a web version, but Mike will be showing you the downloadable version today. There's also, there's also a mobile app you can install on your smartphone or um, your tablets. Uh, I believe it costs a few dollars. I haven't checked, to be honest. Didn't have time to check again, but uh, you can also try it uh, if you want. Um, so again, the links will be posted on the web page. So I'm gonna hand it over to Mike. Thanks a lot for being there, Mike and um, good luck. <laughs> okay, hello everybody. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, as Julie said, my name is Michael Reed and I'm a professor of astronomy at the University of Toronto. And uh, I'm gonna be showing you this wonderful program called Stellarium today. And Stellarium is a, a really great tool. If you ever you know, have gone outside and you've looked up at the sky and you've seen something up there that you don't know what it was and you wanna try and figure that out, Stellarium is a wonderful tool for that. So as Julie said, it's available for free if you're downloading it for your, uh, your Windows computer or your Mac. And you can also download it for your phone or a tablet computer if you want to actually take it outside and look at the sky with it. Uh, but the versions for phones and tablets does have a, a price of a few dollars. Um, we don't make it. It's made by a huge uh, group of volunteers from across the world. And as such, it's a really kind of rich, wonderful program with lots and lots of content in it. So there's tons of stuff that um, you, should, you can do with it, lots of things that you can uh, you know, you can control telescopes with it. You can uh, do all sorts of, you know, even professional astronomy type stuff with it. But I'm going to show you today how you can just find your way around the sky using Stellarium. So hopefully you can see on my screen already uh, the, the window that you get when you start Stellarium. So, uh, and I should mention as well, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them as we go. Uh, Julie will send me the questions and we'll try and answer as many as we can. So you can ask them as I go, or you can ask them uh, towards the end. So when you start Stellarium, uh, you'll see a scene that reflects the current time of day wherever you are. So right now I'm in Toronto in Canada and it's uh, just afternoon. And so when I open Stellarium up, it shows me the daytime sky and you can see the sun up on the top of the sky there. And then in the foreground at the bottom, you see this red letter S. So the red letter S indicates that we are looking south. But we can look anywhere in the sky we want and to do that oh julie sorry um we don't see your screen sharing oh you're not seeing oh hold on one moment let me just reshare how about ah. now can, now can you see yes that's okay better. okay okay sorry about that thank you for letting me know that would have been difficult 
Um, so yeah, so you can see, hopefully now you can see, uh, the foreground is the ground, right? It's the, the earth and there's just this sort of default horizon put in. Up in the top of the sky, you can see the sun up there. And then this red letter S is the uh, southern part of the sky. But we can go anywhere uh, on the earth that we want and we can view in any direction we want. So it starts up in the south, but if you wanna see other parts of the sky, you can just grab the horizon with your mouse and you can just drag around. So here we are looking east, we can look to the northeast, to the north, and we can just keep circling around. We'll get back to the south again, okay? So that is uh, how you kind of just move around the sky. Another thing that you may want to do, for those of you who are joining us from elsewhere in the world, you may want to see how the sky looks from your location. So by default, Stellarium should try and situate you uh, in your local area. It should load up a sky that matches your area on Earth. Uh, but if it doesn't do that, you can go to the side of the window like this, and this little menu should pop up. And at the very top there is the location window. Okay, so if you click on location window, it will give you a map of the earth, and you can click on a location to move to that location. You can come over here and type in a city. So let's say you wanted to do Istanbul, Turkey. You can type that in and click enter, and it would move you to Istanbul. Uh, or if you really want to be very specific, you could type in the latitude and longitude of your, uh, your location on Earth. Um, so those are some options. You can see down here it says get location from network. If, you, if that is clicked, which it should be by default, that means it will try and get uh, your position automatically. Okay, so once you've got your position, the next thing you may want to do, since this is astronomy, is we want to see what the sky looks like at night. So there's different ways to do that. Uh, an easy way is to just go back to the side menu and click the date time window, and then you can change the date right here and the time. So this thing that says, uh, Julie, or where it says date and time, uh, on the left, this is the date, so 2020, March 18. And then the time by default is expressed in this 24 hour format. So 24 hour format means that uh, we don't, you know, change the clock back to, to zero when it hits noon, we just keep counting up. So one o'clock is 13, two o'clock is 14. So on this uh, clock here, you can see it's 14, 8, 23, so it's 208 p.m. in the afternoon. But we can advance time by just clicking the arrows here and we can follow the sun if I drag around. So we'll here it's now, uh, whoops, it's 17 o'clock, 18 o'clock, that's 6 p.m., 19 o'clock, that's 7 p.m. And if we go to 20 o'clock, that's 8 p.m., okay? So at 8 p.m. tonight in Toronto, it will be getting dark. You can see the sun will be setting low in the west there. And now you can start to see some stars come out in the sky. So uh, now we can start looking at what's up in the night sky tonight. Now, if you forgot how to do any of that and you, you know, you're trying to do this yourself and you wanna figure out, oh, how did he do all of those things? There's a really useful help window in Stellarium, which again, if you come into the menu on the side and you click the question mark at the bottom here, the help question mark, it gives you all the options for things you can do. You can, so here are some options about uh, changing the time, uh, different things that you can display or not display as you choose, things like that. Um, so loads and loads of different things you can do with Stellarium. Um, what I want to show you right now, I'm going to uh, use the keyboard controls to get time advancing a little quicker. So if we come down to the bottom here, there's another menu and you can hopefully see, maybe you can't quite see it in the video, but uh, down here it shows you the current time. And you should be able to see that the time is counting up in real time. So every second that passes in the real world, one second is passing in the program. But I want to speed things up a little bit. So I'm just going to press this increase time button and I'm going to increase the rate of passage of time. And you can now start to see that uh, the sky is moving. Everything as the earth rotates is spinning towards the west. Uh, so new stars are, are rising over here in the east and they are setting in the west. Now one of the nice things about Stellarium, if you live in a city where it's hard to see the stars at night because you have a lot of light pollution, uh, you can see things 
uh, in the computer program that you wouldn't be able to see in the real sky. So one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to press the letter F and that's going to get rid of some of the haze at the bottom of the screen here, the sort of atmospheric haze. Uh, and it'll also make the horizon appear to disappear. But that gives us a really dark sky so that we can see lots and lots of detail. OK. So one of the things you can do, uh, you probably know that uh, we divide the sky up into regions uh, by what we call constellations. So I can show you the bound or the uh, outlines of those constellations. For a moment, we'll just pause the uh, flow of time. So here are the boundaries, the, the lines rather, connecting the stars in different constellations. I'm gonna move us around to the north and hopefully you'll see some things that um, at least those of you who live in Canada, you may recognize. Um, so here we are uh, in the northern part of the sky. And if I move us uh, up a little bit here, some of you may recognize uh, some of these shapes that are coming into view. Here's one up here that may be familiar to you. If I turn on the names, uh, you'll see that this one is labeled Ursa Major. This one is labeled Ursa Minor. Ursa Major uh, is a, the, the Latin form of the Big Dipper, or in this case, it's the Big Bear, but most of us think of it as the Big Dipper. Ursa Minor is the Little Bear, or usually we think of it as the Little Dipper. Um, so somebody says, how big is Earth compared to the Sun? That's a really great question. Uh, Earth is a lot smaller than the Sun. Earth is uh, about one millionth the size of the sun, or if you think in terms of uh, the width of the sun, you could fit a hundred Earths all the way across the sun, uh, thereabouts. So here are some constellations that you can recognize. The Little Dipper, there's the Big Dipper up there. And again, if we speed up time, you can see that over the course of the night, as the Earth rotates on its axis, as it spins, the whole sky appears to spin around. And the place that it spins around is this star right here at the tip of the handle of the Little Dipper. Uh, this is the star called Polaris. And if you click on any star in Stellarium, it will give you a whole bunch of information about that star. So at the top, it will tell you the name of the star. And there are a whole bunch of different names uh, for stars by different conventions for naming them. It'll tell you something about the type of the star. So Polaris is a pulsating variable star, meaning that it's a star who, that changes in brightness. It tells you some uh, astronomical technical information about the star, things like that. One thing it says right here is that Polaris is circumpolar, meaning that it never sets. And you can see that that's what's happening right now. We're now back into daytime. And notice that Polaris isn't moving in the sky. It's not rising, it's not setting. Um, other stars are going below the horizon and then coming back up above the horizon, but not Polaris. And that's because Polaris is right above the North Pole of the Earth. So if you went to the North Pole and you stood at the North Pole and pointed directly over your head, you would be pointing directly at the star Polaris. So that means that uh, as that star sits over our North Pole, as the Earth spins, that star stays in the same place directly above us. That's a little bit hard to kind of picture, but you can act it out. Uh, it makes a little bit more sense if you act it out. Um, so there's some more questions coming in. Does Stellarium work on the iPad? It does. Yeah, there's an iPad version of Stellarium uh, that you can download. It does cost a few dollars on an iPad or an iPhone or Android device, um, but the desktop version is free. Uh, somebody else is saying, why are we not able to feel the Earth spinning or its movement? Um, maybe uh, one way to think of that is that the Earth is spinning very, very slowly, uh, you know, in, in kind of absolute terms. If it spun very, very quickly, then you would definitely feel it and we could be uh, flung off the Earth if it spun very, very quickly. Um, why do stars have names? That's a great question. Uh, stars have names mostly because people find it easier to talk about things when we name them. Um, so we usually give the very brightest stars in the sky names. They were given names thousands of years ago. Uh, we can look at some individual stars. If I click on them, uh, let's see if I can find some ones that have, uh, let's go, here's one down here, Capella. This is a very bright star. So Capella has um, a common sort of uh, plain language name. But if I click on some dim stars, let me find a dimmer one, you may see that they have these kind of Greek names, Beta, 
Camelo Pardalis. That's meaning that it's uh, uh, one of the stars in this constellation here, Camelo Pardalis. And having those names just makes them easier to refer to. Um, somebody else said, um, oh, wow, lots of great questions. So how many constellations can you find in the sky? There are, uh, depends on which culture you ask. So in, in North America and in Europe, we often say that there are 88 constellations. And there's this uh, sort of formal governing body of astronomy in the world called the International Astronomical Union. And they define 88 constellations that astronomers use. But different people uh, recognize different constellations. And it varies a little bit from one culture to another which constellations people recognize. OK, so let's go back to the south for a moment. I want to show you a few uh, things you can, can look for. So, uh, some of you, I know not everyone who's joining us is living in a, uh, a bright city. Some of you may be in a very dark location. And if you're in a very dark location and you're willing to stay up late into the night or get up very early in the morning, you may be able to see what is rising here in the southeast. Hopefully you can see that there's a kind of faint wash of light in the sky there. And that faint wash of light, this kind of line of light across the sky, if I move to the east, you'll be able to see more of it. Um, that is our Milky Way galaxy. That is a collection of hundreds of billions of stars that the sun is part of. And it's shaped like a big pancake, and we're in that pancake. So when we look at the sky, we just sort of see, the, uh, see through the pancake to the other stars that are, are in it. Um, you can now also see rising in the southeast right here, three things that are not stars. So most of the things that you're seeing are stars, but these few things here are not stars, they're planets. So if I zoom in, uh, you can do that with your mouse on Stellarium or your, your touchpad. You can zoom into different parts of the sky. So if I zoom in, you can see here that this is Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars. And I'm going to pause time for just a minute. And if we look down at the time on the simulation now, we can see we've gone to Friday, but this will be basically the same any day around now. Whoops. Uh, and we have um, 5.54 AM is the time that we are currently uh, looking at the sky. So if you're willing to get up early, if you get up at about 6 AM when it's still dark and you go out and you look to the Southeast, notice at the bottom it says Southeast, then you will be able to see Saturn, Jupiter and Mars. And to see those, you don't need a telescope, you don't need binoculars or any special equipment. You can just see them with your naked eye. They're going to be really, really bright, um, easy to see. So those are four planets, but you have to get up, or sorry, three planets. You have to get up pretty early to see those. I want to show you if we go back to the south, and now we're going to go back and change the time. We're going to go uh, back to the evening. So we'll come back to today and we'll go to evening time. So I'll set it to just after sunset. So here we are at around uh, 9, well, I'll go back to about 8 p.m. And if we go to the west, where the sun has just set, uh, we should be able to see, if I zoom out a little bit, sorry, yeah, there we go. Uh, we should be able to see right here, in the west, fairly low in the sky, is currently the brightest thing in the whole sky, and that's the planet Venus. So we're now at about 8 p.m. this evening, but if I change the day, so here we are on March 18th, if I go to the 19th or the 20th or the 21st, you can see Venus will still be there for quite a while. Um, so if you want to go out tonight and see the planet Venus, you know, maybe after dinner time before you go to bed, uh, you can look low in the west and you'll see a super, super bright light. Uh, it's really easy to pick out and that is the planet Venus. Okay, lots of questions coming in. So are we discovering any new constellations? Um, we don't discover new constellations because these constellations that you're seeing on the screen right now, they were all developed uh, thousands of years ago, most of them. Some of them are only a few hundred years ago. And they were usually uh, created to um, tell stories about what was going on in the sky. So we can actually look at the pictures that underlie the constellations. So you can start to get a sense of what they're meant to represent. So here's a famous constellation of Orion the Hunter. 
And people have been identifying Orion as a hunter for thousands of years. And they tell all these stories about uh, what Orion is up to in the sky. And most of those stories were kind of set hundreds or thousands of years ago, and we don't change them today. So we don't really discover new ones. Um, lots of good questions. So another one, uh, is there a star bigger than the sun? So we're in the perfect part of the sky here to talk about stars bigger than the sun. I'm gonna move us a little bit later to get rid of the sun. So here we are in the evening, and we're gonna look at this constellation, the constellation of Orion. Probably a lot of you have seen this constellation. If you know any constellations, this is one of the ones you're, you're likely to know. I'll get rid of the pictures again so that you can, uh, I just press the R key to get rid of the pictures or bring them back, press R, press R again. Uh, and in this constellation of Orion, a lot of people recognize it because it has these three belt stars, right? So if I turn on the picture, you can see that these three stars are the belt of this hunter. And if we zoom in a little bit, you can see there's a lot going on in this constellation. So down here, uh, you can see this kind of fuzzy blob in the constellation. That is called the Orion Nebula. So if I zoom in to the Orion Nebula, you'll see that Stellarium will actually show you detailed pictures of different parts of the sky taken by uh, telescopes. So this faint fuzzy patch, which you can actually see a little bit with your naked eye if you're in a dark location, this faint fuzzy patch is a place where brand new stars are being born. We call it a star forming nebula, a place where new stars are coming into existence. Um, that's one fun thing. But if you look uh, at the whole constellation again, and you look down here in the lower right hand corner, if I turn the picture on, you'll see this star called Rigel lines up with one of Orion's ankles. And then up in this corner, this star called Betelgeuse lines up with one of Orion's shoulders. So Betelgeuse and Rigel. Both Betelgeuse and Rigel are way, way, way bigger than the sun, thousands of times the size of the sun. And uh, they're what are called super giant stars, really, really colossally big stars. You could fit thousands of the sun inside each of them. Um, Betelgeuse is a, an especially impressive big star. If you put Betelgeuse down in our solar system where the sun is, so take the sun away, put Betelgeuse there, it would swallow all the planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, all the way out to Earth, Mars, almost all the way to Jupiter. It's a really, really big star. And Betelgeuse is actually a great star to look at these days because it's doing something weird. Uh, Betelgeuse is a very, very big, bright star, but lately it's been getting less bright. So if you've ever looked at it in the past, maybe you know six months ago, and you go out and look at it tonight, you might notice it's a lot dimmer than it used to be. And that's because Betelgeuse is in the process of dying. It's an old star and it's starting to sort of uh, age quite a bit. And as it ages, it's releasing material into the space around it that is blocking its light and making it harder to see. So it's getting a bit dimmer. It was getting quite dim in January. And now it's actually picking up again a little bit. So that's an example of a star that's much bigger than the sun. Uh, someone's asking, how many stars explode per day? Uh, that depends on how far away you're willing to look. But Betelgeuse is the kind of star that is someday going to explode. Uh, in, we don't know exactly when, but sometime probably in the next about 100,000 years. So that seems like a long time, but in astronomy, that's sort of a short time. Uh, within that time, Betelgeuse is expected to blow up. And in our Milky Way galaxy, this big collection of a few hundred billion, 100 million, sorry, 100 billion stars, uh, a star blows up, you know, once every couple of decades, roughly. But if we look at other galaxies around the sky with telescopes, we can see stars blowing up almost every day. And as we get bigger telescopes, we will almost certainly see them blowing up every day, multiple times a day. Um, so those are some of the things you can see in the sky. You can see uh, planets, constellations. I showed you the Orion Nebula. Now I want to show you, uh, if you want to sort of find some more advanced things in the sky, uh, there are some tricks to be able to find interesting stuff in the sky. So one thing a lot of people like to look for is the very brightest star in the whole sky. 
And you can find that using the constellation of Orion. So in Orion, if you look at these belt stars here, the three belt stars, and you follow them in the direction sort of down towards the horizon, so connect them in a straight line and go down towards the horizon, you point very close to this star right here. This is Sirius, the brightest star in the whole sky. So if you're watching from the Northern Hemisphere uh, in, in Canada or Europe or Asia, you should be able to see Sirius. If you happen to be watching from the very far in the Southern Hemisphere, maybe you're in Australia, you may not be able to see Sirius, but um, it's the brightest star in the whole sky. Uh, if you go the other way in Orion, so you connect these three belt stars and you connect them in the opposite direction from Sirius, they head over here towards the constellation of Taurus, the bull. So if I turn on the pictures again, you can see the bull uh, of Taurus. And in the bull, if I zoom in on Taurus, you can see uh, this bright star called Aldebaran. Aldebaran is another giant star like Betelgeuse. It's a sort of a big bright star, bigger than the sun. Um, but what you can also see, if you keep following that line from the belt stars, uh, so here are the belt stars in Orion, you follow them all the way across, you pass Aldebaran, and you come over here, you see this faint group of stars? Let's zoom in on those. So if I zoom in in that part of the sky, you see that this is not one star, but a little group of stars. Uh, and this group of stars is called the Pleiades. It's a star cluster. It's a, a group of stars that formed relatively recently, again, recently in astronomy terms, so around 100 million years ago, which sounds like a really long time. But in astronomy terms, that's pretty recent. So this is a new group of stars in the sky that you can see. And you can see them even from within a city. Even if you've never kind of looked for them before, you never noticed that there was a star cluster. You don't need any special equipment, no telescope, no binoculars. You can see them just with your unaided eye. Um, but if you do have a telescope or some binoculars, you'll be able to see even more stars in that part of the sky. Okay, so those are a lot of the things that uh, you can see in the night sky today. Maybe we'll take a few more questions. So uh, are constellations always formed of stars? Yes, constellations are always formed from stars because from night to night, the stars remain in the same positions. And that lets us identify pictures that don't change much over hundreds or thousands of years. So I can show you why we don't use planets. So here's Venus again in the center of the screen. If I go back to our date time window uh, and I change the date, watch Venus. Okay, watch how Venus moves relative to the stars around it. So if I move us forward a, uh, a day, you see that the stars stay in their same positions, right? The shape of Taurus or the shape of Orion isn't changing. But Venus is moving back and forth. There goes the moon racing past Venus. Uh, Venus is moving. Here it's going to pass right through the Pleiades. And that's why we don't use planets to make constellations, because the planets move around as they orbit the sun. But the stars keep roughly their, their fixed positions. Uh, someone said, will Betelgeuse kill people on Earth when it blows up? No, definitely not. Uh, Betelgeuse is a really big star. It's going to explode in a humongous explosion called a supernova, but it's far enough away that it won't be any danger to anyone on Earth. Uh, somebody asked, are there black holes in constellations? There are. And so I will show you one more feature. So let's say you want to find something in the sky and you don't know how to use all these tricks to you know, find it based on uh, lines from constellations. You can come over to this menu again and you can click search window. So that will bring up this little window and you can just type in, you know, Mars and then press enter. And you'll notice right now it's taken me, it's pointing me to the ground. And what that's telling me is Mars is not currently above the horizon. So if I uh, set time advancing, it's going to have us follow Mars and oh, there it goes. Now Mars is now above the horizon and there it is circled there. But you were asking about black holes. So I'm going to show you. Um, let's see if Stellarium will help us find. Oops. Uh, so there is a black hole relatively near to the uh, solar system, not close enough to be dangerous. And it's in the constellation of Cygnus. So if we move to the constellation of Cygnus, uh, Cygnus, you can see here in the picture, is the swan. 
if I turn off the picture, you'll see it's got this kind of long neck and then these two wings. And there is a black hole in this direction in the constellation of Cygnus called Cygnus X1. Uh, that was actually discovered at the University of Toronto many years ago. Uh, you can't see it because it's a black hole. Uh, and it's black and absorbs all the light. But if you look in that direction, you can maybe uh, feel some pleasure knowing that you are looking at a black hole, even though you can't see it. And it's not posing any danger to Earth at all. Uh, somebody else asked, if, is there a black hole in the middle of the Milky Way? There absolutely is. So if we come over here to the constellation of Sagittarius, uh, Sagittarius is often recognized for this kind of teapot shape. So here's kind of the handle of a teapot. Here's the part where the tea goes in. Here's the lid and here's the spout. That's the teapot of Sagittarius. Uh, if I turn on the picture, you'll see Sagittarius is meant to be an archer, but the teapot is easiest to pick out. Sagittarius is very close uh, on the sky to the middle of our galaxy, which is this big kind of wash of stars right here. That's the center of our Milky Way galaxy. And deep, 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 deep in the center of the galaxy, there is an enormous black hole, about 4 million times the mass of the sun. So there is a black hole there but it's also not posing any, uh, any um, harm to Earth. Someone says, uh, are all these stars, are they in different galaxies? The stars that you're seeing right now are almost all of them in the Milky Way galaxy, our own galaxy, but we can actually see other galaxies. So let's do that now. If we go to the find window, I'm gonna type M, oops, M31. M31, or the Andromeda galaxy, up there at the top, you can see the name, is the nearest big galaxy to our own Milky Way. And as you can see, it doesn't look like much. You may not even be able to see it in the video. But if I zoom in, you can see that the Andromeda galaxy is a galaxy very much like our own Milky Way. It's a great big spiral galaxy. And you can see it with your naked eye just very faintly, uh, but you have to be in a fairly dark location. But if you have a telescope or even binoculars, it makes it a bit easier to see. Those of you who might be joining us from the Southern Hemisphere, you can look for what is called the LMC. So the LMC is the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's uh, another galaxy that you can't see from the Northern Hemisphere, but if you could see it, uh, if you're in Australia or in New Zealand or South Africa, something like that, uh, you would be able to see this galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud, from your location. So maybe a couple more questions before we uh, wrap up. Let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, how long does it take, take for light from Rigel to get to the Earth? Uh, that is an excellent question. So let's go back to Rigel. And again, we can, if we don't know how to find it, we can just type its name and press enter. And we should go back to it. I probably, did I zoom in too much? Oops. Oh, I was underground. Okay, so let's bring Rigel up in the night. So there's Rigel. And when we click on Rigel, I think somewhere in here it will tell us, uh, it may tell us the distance. Does it tell us? It doesn't actually have the distance. Oh yeah, right here, distance, 862.85 LY. An LY is a light year. So uh, a light year is the distance that light travels in one year. And that means that if light leaves Rigel today, because Rigel is 862 light years away, that light is gonna take 862 years to get to us. Or another way to think of that is that when you look at Rigel today, the light you are seeing left Rigel 862 years ago. So if we go back up to Betelgeuse and we click on Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse is 490, 98 basically light years away. And that means that the light you're seeing from Betelgeuse today left Betelgeuse 500 years ago. And one weird thing that could mean is maybe Betelgeuse already blew up, but it will take time for the light from the explosion to reach us. Okay, so I know uh, you guys have got lots of great questions. We're going to keep making ourselves available to you uh, every day. 
uh, on this Astro at Home program, giving you lots of opportunities to ask questions. If you want to follow up on any of the topics we've already talked about, uh, Julie has another webinar on the Discover the Universe YouTube channel, specifically about Beetlejuice. So you can go and learn what's going on with Beetlejuice and what will happen to Beetlejuice, things like that. Um, but we'll also be joining you uh, every day for the next little while, bringing you more uh, interesting and hopefully inspiring astronomy content. So thank you everyone for participating and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Yes, thank you, Mike. And thanks everyone for participating. And uh, just a quick note about the, um, what Mike just mentioned about Beetlejuice. It's in the uh, news section of our website. We do have a post about uh, Beetlejuice that I made a few weeks ago. Um, so thanks a lot, everyone. I hope you enjoy this. So it was a great overview of Stellarium. So please go have fun and use it. And a great overview of the night sky. So we invite you to Go outside, stay in your backyard because we're not supposed to group you know, <laughs> around too much. Uh, but um, please have a look at Venus whenever you can. At least it's beautiful out there. So thanks a lot, Mike. And thanks, everyone. Thank you.